Welcome, church. Wherever you are, whenever you're watching this, we are glad that you are joining us. And today, you might notice something a little different. Uh, throughout this worship service, we are changing things up a little bit, so you might want to stay on your toes. And I have a few announcements for you, but the first one is our worship services. Right now, we have different opportunities to participate in worship, and one is one you're participating in right now, our online service, and that is generally on YouTube. But something that a lot of people don't know is we have an interactive online worship service, and that's on Sunday evenings at 5 p.m., and that's at fbcsalinas.online.church, and uh, it's a great time there. You can talk to Pastor John and myself. We can pray with you, and we can just interact as we worship the Lord together. And another one is Sunday mornings at 10.30 uh, in the backyard, in the back lawn. We come together, and we worship the Lord there. My second announcement is info. Uh, if you have moved, you change your phone number, you have a new email address. We encourage you to email, email info at fbcsalinas.com so we can update your information. And uh, people in the leadership team here at the church are trying to reach out to people, uh, but we need updated information. And if you haven't been receiving updates from us uh, via email or text, that means we don't have your information. So we encourage you to email info at fbcsalinas.com. And also uh, online on our website at fbcsalinas.com, we have the bulletin, which has all the information that you need on it right there. And my last announcement is prayer. Prayer is a big, big part of uh, FBC Salinas. It's one of our core values. And uh, if you are in need of prayer, please email prayer at at fbcsalinas.com, and there's a whole team of people who will be praying for you, and if you ever have any prayer concerns, feel free to go there. And speaking of prayer, let's open up uh, in some prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning and this time together. Lord, thank you for the ability to worship you and uh, open and freely worship you. And Lord, thank you for the technology that we can still proclaim your word. Lord, I pray you guide this service. You please use John in his message. Please use the worship team as they, as they lead us in songs. And Lord, may you be glorified every step of the way. And in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, the worship team is going to go through our songs, and we are going to lift our voices and sing out how his grace is enough. And we know this because he is risen. He is risen indeed.
to the portion of our service where we have our guided prayer. And what's going to happen is there's going to be some topics that come up behind me on screen, and we are going to go through them together, and we're going to pray through them together. And uh, I encourage you to pray as you feel led. Well, Father, we thank you for all that you do for us. And Lord, I, I, I want to lift up the, all the first responders out there, people like Daryl Simpson, people like Jamal Shepard, people like Lee Martin, people like my brother, Brandon Matthew. Lord, I pray that you guide them and keep them safe. And Lord, I pray for the frontline workers. I pray you give them wisdom and, and protection for, for everyone in, the, in this church who is in a frontline business. Lord, I pray you, you keep your hand of protection on them. Keep them safe. Lord, I pray for schools and the Monterey County. I mean, schools across this nation. But Lord, I pray for the teachers and the admin of, you know, Melody Park, schools in Greenfield, schools in Soledad, schools in, in Salinas, schools in Watsonville, and all the surrounding areas. Lord, as they are trying to navigate next year and how they're going to do next year to educate our young people. Lord, I pray you guide them to make the safest possible decisions and to keep our young people safe. Lord, I pray for those in government. Uh, the government officials, Lord, they have, you know, a heavy weight on their shoulder. And Lord, I pray you guide them that they make, you know, decisions. And, and I pray that they are more concerned about people rather than politics. Lord, I pray for the churches in Salinas, especially our, our brothers and sisters over at St. Ansgar's. We want to lift them up today. And Lord, I pray that you guide the leadership there, and I pray that they continue to be salt and light. Lord, I thank you for this community of Christ followers. And Lord, I pray that we uh, continue to be salt and light, that every move we make and every step that we take goes to glorifying you. Lord, I thank you for the generosity of this community. Lord, we pray that we glorify you in everything that we do. And in the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. 
And there are many ways to support the ministry here at FBC. Uh, you can give tithes and offerings by going to fbcsalinas.com, clicking the yellow donate button. You can set up bill pay uh, with your bank. Um, but at the end of service, you might have noticed today is actually the first Sunday of the month. Today is Communion Sunday. And it's a tradition here that we take our benevolent offering at the end of service. And Pastor John is going to talk a little bit more about that. But the tithes and offerings are what support the ministry here in FBC. And the benevolent offering goes to those who are in need. And I want to thank you for your continued generosity. Upon receiving my driver's license, I proceeded to do something that today I find somewhat humorous, yet back in that time, my parents didn't find it overly humorous. As a matter of fact, it caused more than a few conversations between they and I. And for in the first six years of my, what I call my driving career, I received one speeding ticket a year. It was something I thought rather funny, but... For some reason, Jack and Grace Bosick did not find it overly amusing, so much so that they, there was some discipline involved. We'll leave it at that. But, uh, but it really, I, I never grasped how serious this was and, and what, what the issues were very well. Yes, I had to pay the ticket and, and, and we proceeded, but it, was, it, caused some, it caused some harm. Let's just leave it at that. And, and it took a speeding ticket that I received during my last semester at Wheaton College to awaken me to the truth that humor probably was not, I repeat, was not the best response. I was being informed, I was informed by the officer who pulled me over for speeding. I was informed by him that because I was an out-of-state college student, that I would definitely need to appear before, I would need to make a presence in court to, uh, to deal with this particular situation. And so he told me, they told me the when the date was going to be, and, and believe it or not, I was excited I was excited about going to court. I was looking forward to it. And as each day approached, I found myself getting more and more excited. And perhaps you're wondering, why would you be excited about going to court? Well, here's why. I had seen plenty of episodes of the People's Court, and I really liked Judge Wapner. I liked the way Judge Wapner interacted with the plaintiff and the defendant. And, and so, and then at the end of it, there's this interview between the, the parties. And so I'm thinking, this is going to be fantastic. I'll get to see the judge. I'll get to interact with the judge. And at the end of it, I'm going to have some type of, a, some type of an interview to, to find out my response to the judge's verdict. Yes, you can go ahead and chuckle right now. It was delusional. And let me just say this. I wish it had gone as, I, as my delusion led me to believe. But the only thing that I can remember from that experience were the following. Number one, there wasn't a whole lot of bantering between the judge and myself. Number two, there was no interview after I was told the penalty. And number three, I was judged justly, rightly, and I felt icky afterwards. It wasn't this joyous experience whatsoever. It was matter of fact, and then these words came out of the judge's mouth. Mr. Bosick. I hope you don't find it so humorous the next time you get a speeding ticket because getting a speeding ticket annually for six years is not something to laugh about. Boom. Over. Judgment came. Judgment was received. I paid the penalty. 
and it was unpleasant. It was unpleasant being judged. Did I deserve to be judged? I most certainly did. And this morning, as we continue looking at this Sermon on the Mount that Jesus proclaimed a couple thousand years ago, we read these words, do not judge. And we'll just stop there for a moment before we continue on in the passage. And so we can look at this and say, what's going on here? But what's going on is this, is as Jesus lays this out, he says, you need to take a look in the mirror and you need to pay attention to the message because they matter. I invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, and we will start at verse 1. And Jesus says these words, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye. You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces." Father, we ask now as we come to this time of looking at your word, we would ask that your Holy Spirit would open our eyes to see more clearly who you are and what you're, what, what you're all about, that you would open our ears to hear the message, to hear this message clearer, more, much more clear today than before today, that you would give us minds to understand what you have to say to us through this passage. And that you would give us hearts that are transformed by the simple fact that your Holy Spirit is at work in us, helping us in our discernment. And Lord, may no one hear anything I say, but may they only hear what it is that you want them to hear, that you need them to hear. And that you, Lord Jesus Christ, would be lifted up, that you would be glorified, that you would be the one doing the transformation. We love you, we thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So there's this phrase that says this, what goes around comes around. We've heard that phrase a number of times, at least I have in the midst of my life. But, but rather than looking at that entire phrase, I want to look at the last part of that phrase, comes around. Because that's what Jesus is talking about here in verses 1 and 2. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Jesus is saying you need to realize that what goes around comes around. And what you need to realize is what comes around sometimes is something that's a little unpleasant for you. So as we deal with this, and as we open up this particular section of, of the Sermon on the Mount, I want you to realize this, that verses 1 and 2, and especially verse 1, could be argued that it is one of the most misused verses in the entire Bible. Let that sink in. I don't know how many verses are in the entire Bible. I guess I could have done some Bible trivia and done that, but, but there are a lot of verses in the Bible. This one verse seems to be so misused in so many different ways. And what do I mean by that? Well, let me lay out a scenario for you. You see someone do something that you find offensive or foolish, and you make a comment about it, and immediately are told the following, don't judge me. And so people look at it, and just like that, you're shut down. And just like that, it's almost as if the people are saying, listen, I know this verse, whether they're a believer or not, whether they're a Christ follower or not, I know that it says that in the Bible. And in essence, what they're saying is they're using it to exercise their freedom to do as they want, no matter what the impact it has on anyone else. People look at this verse and say, I can do as I please. And you can't stop me. Yet, really? Is that what Jesus would do here? Is that what Jesus would do here? 
These opening verses are not a license for people to do as they please. Why do I say that? It's because of an obvious truth that's found throughout Scripture, and that obvious truth is this, that we are told throughout the Bible to think, to consider. Therefore, we make judgments all the time. Jesus doesn't want us to turn off our brains when we see something wrong happening. Wrong is wrong. Sin is sin. He wants us to address that. And so thinking that these verses are a license to do as we please, it happens, it happens so easily when we lift this verse from its context. It's an unwise move that always leads to bigger problems. By the way, consider this, what he says in verse 1, do not judge or you too will be judged. But then you go down to verse 6 and look what he says here, do not give give dogs what is sacred, do not throw your pearls to pigs. Verse 6 is a judgment call, isn't it? So Jesus isn't talking about simply just go with it. So what's he driving at here? And and before we even get to that, and I need to remind you of this before I forget, there's an entire book of the Bible called Judges. Do you see what's going on here? We need to keep the bigger picture in mind and not lift this out of there. So it leads to this question. What is Jesus driving at in these opening verses? What seems to be going on here? What Jesus is driving at is this, is that he's he's talking about sinful judgments. And let me lay that out for you. And it's not going to come up on the screen, but I want you to understand what he's driving at here. Sinful judgments, what does that mean? First off, a superficial judgment. Superficial judgment is, is making a judgment solely on appearance before you get the facts. You're simply making a conclusion and and wrapping it up without even having the facts. You're not doing your research. The second type of sinful judgment he's talking about is a hypocritical judgment. And I think that goes without saying. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to verses 3 to 5. But but it's pointing out other people's faults without realizing you have faults. We'll talk more about that later. The other thing is this, being harsh and unforgiving. It's amazing right now in this world in which we live how incredibly harsh and unforgiving people are. You do one wrong thing, you pay the price for the rest of your life. There is no forgiveness. You made a mistake and you will pay for the rest of your life. Jesus is talking about that as well. And then perhaps the bigger one is this, self-righteousness. Believing that you are above all fault. Believing that you make a judgment that is so perfect that there is no fault within you whatsoever. And then lastly, and this is abundantly clear, an untrue judgment. Slandering someone for the sake of getting your own way. When Jesus is talking about do not judge or you too will be judged, he's talking about making a sinful judgment, abusing a situation so that you can gain power, so that you can have the power. And what Jesus seems to be saying here also is this, is be careful about passing judgment on a person because the way you do it will be brought upon you as well. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Here's a quote that will come up on the screen here momentarily, and I find it very appropriate. It says this, It is further true to say that there are no people who are more sensitive to criticism than those who are always criticizing others. We've met those people before, haven't we? And perhaps, if we're honest... We can be those people as well. 
This quote really grabbed me because, because as you look at the context of what's going on here, Jesus, throughout the Sermon on the Mount, seems to be directing quite a few statements at the Pharisees who were regarded as the ones who had it all figured out. And as you look at the way the Pharisees treated people, they were incredibly quick to judge. They were incredibly quick to come up with consequences. They were incredibly quick to nitpick. They were incredibly quick to do all of these things. And of all the groups, of all the groups in the Gospels that Jesus criticized and, and perhaps you could even say made judgments on and shared judgments with, they are the only group that responded to Jesus so harshly. He made a judgment on the woman caught in adultery. Notice her response was one of graciousness. He made a judgment when he was talking to Nicodemus that night in John chapter 3. Nicodemus' response was, I need to get to know Jesus better. He made a judgment on Peter, saying, you're going to deny me three times, yet what does Peter do? Yes, Peter denies him three times, yet later on, Peter realizes, I need Jesus in my life. You see, Jesus shared openly with people what he thought. And it seems to me that the people that thought that they were more than what they really were were the very people that responded harshly to him. As a matter of fact, these people dealt so harshly with Jesus Christ that they were the core group that led him to being betrayed, that led him to being crucified. So I ask you this. How do you respond to Jesus? How do you respond to what he has to say about you? Because of all people, he's the one who makes the right judgment. Do not judge or you too will be judged is not a license to do as you please. It causes us to take a look at ourselves and what's going on. It causes us to take a look in the mirror. We go to verse 3. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck from your brother's eye. One way that I like to read verses 3 to 5, and if I were to give it a little title, it would be this, check yourself before you wreck yourself. I had a number of people in my life use that phrase on me before, and it makes sense. And what Jesus is driving at here is, is very clear here. You need to check what's going on within you before you make a move here. And I said this at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, and I did it for the first number of weeks, and it was this statement that Jesus understands humanity far better than humanity understands humanity, and that holds true here especially. He understands the way we operate. He understands that we're quick to judge, and he says, you need to check yourself right now, because that's what's going on here in verses 3 to 5. That's what's happening here. And I love the imagery that Jesus gives us here. Jesus, as we know this to be true, going as he, as he grew up, he was known as many people talk to him talk about him being a carpenter. But but Jesus, what was called he was what was called a tecton, meaning he could fix anything and everything. Yes, carpentry was part of it. But Jesus was he was he was this guy who was able to to fix anything that was wrong with your house. In essence, you could almost call Jesus a handyman. That's the way he grew up. And so he understands carpentry really well. We know that. And look what he does here. He says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? Every single one of us, I guarantee it, every single one of us has had a speck enter into our eye. Specks are irritants, aren't they? Dust is flying all the way all around and, and things like that. But if a little speck of dust comes into our eye, what happens? We notice instantly. 
It's a little speck, but yet it takes all of our attention. We rub our eye, all of a sudden our eye gets redder. Our eye has a natural response to it where it begins to water to try and, to try and alleviate the pain. So Jesus brings this up. He says, you know, why do you look at the speck of, of sawdust in your brother's eye? Everybody knows how irritating a speck of dust is. And then you're thinking, okay, Jesus will simply navigate this. And then look what he does. And you pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. All of a sudden, you're reading this and you're hearing this for the first time saying, Jesus, I understand about specks, but I've never had a plank in my eye. A plank. He goes from a speck to a plank. You're talking, I, I'm not a construction guy. You're talking like, I'll just throw this, a two by 12. Is that, is that? We'll just say whatever. I, you know, people are, those of the, never mind. I don't know what I'm, it's putting a two by four. I am completely out of my element. Please don't turn off the, the service right now. I'll bring it back to what I do know. So you have a two by four coming out of your eye. Nobody has that. And if you do, by the way, if you do have a two by four coming out of your eye, you're blind. Specks are irritants. Planks cause blindness. You have a speck in your eye. You need somebody to help you out. The person that you're going to go to to get the help isn't one that's blind. And that's what Jesus is driving at here. You need help. And notice what he says in verse 4. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? I like to consider, I would like to submit that Jesus is addressing spec check specialists. Spec check specialists. Say that fast five times. Spec check specialists who specialize in looking at other people's specs. You ever been around those people? You ever been around those people who every time that you make a move, every word that you say, and perhaps at times you even feel like any thought that you, even any thought that you think, it's being checked? Little specks, they're looking. They're looking. They're going to do what they can because they're a spec check specialist. Jesus is addressing those individuals here. Saying, if you want to be that type of a person, you're going down the wrong road here. The Pharisees were spec check specialists. They had doctorates in it. There are people in our lives who are spec check specialists. And they thrive by pointing out all your little specks. And here's what's scary about it. They seem to enjoy it. They seem to enjoy it. Jesus is saying, you ought not be enjoying that. Jesus is saying, you have allowed a plank to build in your eye, and therefore you need to pull that plank out of your eye. So notice what he says here in verse 5. You hypocrite. Never thought that I, I, you might be able to prove me wrong, but I think when Jesus calls people a hypocrite, it's not exactly a term of endearment. It's not exactly an encouraging thing to hear. Being a spec check specialist is not something that we should take pride in. Because we're failing to take a look at ourselves. We're failing to check ourselves. And because of that, we end up wrecking ourselves. But notice what Jesus does here. So often, we stop here. First take the plank out of your own eye. But notice what he says at the end. He says, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. 
That speck still needs to be removed, but yet what needs to happen is you need to take a look at what's going on inside here. So, so I put together a little, bit of, a, little, a little checklist for you here. And the first question that needs to be asked is this, have I checked myself? Have I, have I considered what's going on within me? And I want you to keep this in mind. That side view mirror on your car, on the passenger side, those words that say objects are closer than they appear, applies to each and every one of us. These issues, we have our own issues. There's stuff that we want to believe isn't there, but yet it is really there. So much so that it's become a plank in our eye. We need to ask God, Lord, please open my eyes to see these planks, to see these things that need to be removed so that I can then see clearly. So then we move into the next part, which is this, and we need to ask another question is this, is the cause of Christ being hindered by this particular person's actions? Galatians chapter 4 verse 19 says this, I am in pain for you until Christ is formed in you. Paul's telling the Galatians, we need to grow in Christ. We need to understand better how to live our lives in Christ. And so as we go to help remove a speck, and, or we think we need to be involved in helping remove the speck, one of the things we have to ask is, is the cause of Christ actually being hindered by this person's actions? If the answer to that is yes, then we can proceed Then the next question I think is important is this. Is this issue more about me than Jesus? You'll notice the second question and the third question seem to go hand in hand. Sometimes people's idiosyncrasies really bother us. But yet it's not impacting the kingdom. It's not impacting God's rule in one's life. But yet we want to think that it does. And that's why we are to be constantly checking ourselves here. So is this really more about me and me being uncomfortable? Or is it really about the cause of Christ? Then this, la- this next one I think is, is, is very important. Do I have a solution or only criticism? My favorite professor in college was a, was, was a man by the name of Dr. Ivan Foss. I love this man. He died a number of years ago, and I I loved this man. He was the only prof I had that wore a bow tie, and and he had great wisdom and great passion, not only for Jesus Christ, but also for people and for justice, and and he he exuded this. And in our social research class, as we're doing these different papers on, on research projects that we were doing, he said this, and this is very profound, and I've never forgotten it. Anyone can criticize. We are called to make it better. Great words. It's easy for me to criticize you here about this or this person about that. It's real easy for me to criticize. But can I give a solution? Can I make the situation better? It's one thing to point the finger. It's a whole nother thing to help the situation get resolved. We live in a world right now that's really good at criticizing, but it's horrible at solutions. As a Christ follower, yes, we can make judgments, but we need to be involved in helping resolve the situation. Another question is this, do I have this person's best interest in mind? You can flip to Matthew chapter 18, and Jesus lays out some pretty clear guidelines here about a person caught in sin. And so we need to be concerned about that person, but are we going to restore them, or are we simply going to criticize them and shame them and leave them be? In Matthew chapter 18, it's all about restoration. It's all about restoring this this person. And then the last question that I think we need to answer is this. And I'm going to give you the clue here. Look at verse 5. Look at verse 4. Look at verse 3. In essence, look at verses 3 to 5. 
Notice what he says here. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? Verse 4. How can you say to your brother? Verse 5. Then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Have I forgotten this person is family? Jesus says three different times, verses three, four, and five, he says, brother, brother, brother. And you can expand it to brother and sister. Why is this important? It's important because we're family. We're family. We care for one another. We reach out to one another. We're looking out for one another in a way that helps us get better and stronger as a family. Notice Jesus doesn't simply say this. He doesn't, he's not vague here. He's very direct. Your brother, your brother, your brother. He wants us to realize we're in this together. And when we realize that, when we realize we're in this together, it helps us resolve things much more beautifully, much more graciously. Because notice, the end goal in verse 5 is to remove the speck, to make the person whole, to free them to live more fully. It'd be really nice if Jesus stopped at verse 5, but he doesn't. (laughs) He doesn't. Verse 6, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. The reality is this. We want to think that our efforts will be well received. Yet Jesus points out in verse 6, it may very well not be well received. That message, that carpenter's message may not be very well received. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. It's a judgment call. If a person is unresponsive or or not receptive, we do not continue to shove the message down their throat. We just don't. And one of the things as you look through this, notice, keep in mind, he's talking to, to people who understand, who, who understand a, Jewish, a Jewish upbringing because predominantly that's who they were. He was speaking to the Jews. And notice the two animals that he decides to, to select here. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. Both dogs and pigs were considered unclean animals by the Jews. Now, you cat lovers are saying, see, I told you so, Pastor John. But that's a whole nother conversation. Dogs and pigs were considered unclean. Jesus is saying the way a person responds to my message of restoration, they may very well say, I don't need anything. And the scary thing is this, if we don't pay attention to what's going on with this message of Christ, it can get ugly. And one of the things that Jesus is driving at, look at this. Do not give pigs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. Notice this. Sacred. Something that is lofty. The message of Christ is priceless. Pearls back in Jesus Christ's day were considered, were, were considered the diamonds, the, the, rare, the rare jewel that was priceless. Jesus is saying, my message, the message that I want to communicate to people is priceless. It has great value. Don't simply be willy-nilly with it. Understand this message of salvation, this message of restoration is priceless. It's powerful. Yet people will respond in a way that's not always pleasant. Look what he says. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Jesus' carpentry skills handle specks and planks of all sizes. Yet there are those times when there's a resistance to this. And that resistance causes great harm, not only to that person, but it could perhaps turn on the other person as well. 
What Jesus is driving at here in this whole in this whole in these in this whole passage about not judging or being judged, it isn't about doing whatever you please. It's about how are you going to respond to his carpentry skills in your life? How are you going to respond? Are you going to trample them under feet? Are you going to turn on the person that's sharing this redemptive message of Jesus Christ? Are you going to turn on them and trample them under feet? How have you responded to these carpentry skills of Jesus Christ? How have you responded to these carpentry skills that are so precise that they can exact out the speck of dust in your eye? That are so powerful that they can remove a plank from your eye. How do you respond to that message? Jesus wants us to see clearly. And Jesus is the one who helps us see clearly because he clearly sees us. There is no speck in his eyes. There is no plank in his eyes. He sees us for who we truly are. And he's the one that can provide a message and not only a message, he can provide the healing, the restoration that you and I need. How will we respond to that? Because it's about seeing clearly. It's about having people in our lives who help us see clearly. And more importantly, it's about Jesus Christ removing those specks so that we can clearly see him and clearly see this world that desperately needs a savior. I'm going to invite the worship team up here, and and as they get ready, I invite us uh, to take some moments here and reflect on how we're responding. How do we respond to this message of clear vision that Christ wants us to have? Are there people in our lives who God's laid on our heart that we need to help in whatever way we can, yet we can't see them because we have planks in our eyes? Do we have a situation in our own life where we need help and we need to be responsive and receptive to the message that perhaps somebody needs to share with us about Jesus Christ. And one last one is this. Do we need to have hearts that are open to his redemptive message to remove the specks? So let's take some time and reflect on these words. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the message that he proclaimed so clearly. We thank you for that message that has rescued life after life after life. And we would ask now, as we reflect on these words, that your Holy Spirit would do the work necessary to help us see the specks, to help us see the planks. And that you would help us to receive your message and proceed appropriately so that we can see clearly. Bring to mind those ideas, those specks, those planks right now that are in our life that we need you to remove again. And Father, according to what Jesus Christ says here, we have people in our lives who need our help. We have people in our lives who need our help in such a way that that we can provide that help, not because of us, but because of the work that you've done in us and how you want to use us to help them. And so we pray that we not forget that. We pray that you would help us see clearly how to help others see you and how to help others see clearly in life. So bring to mind those individuals, and then, Lord, bring 
your grace into that situation. We don't want to be spec check specialists. We want to be people who see the importance of your amazing grace and how that can transform people's lives. So help us there, Lord. And Lord, if there's anyone who does not know you, we would ask that at this particular time you would move in such a way that they would say yes to having you do the removal, the speck, the speck removal, the plank removal, and that they would come to understand who you truly are and the vision and the life that you provide that is crystal clear. So, Lord, we love you, and we thank you for being faithful to us. And we pray now that we would be a people that responds to you in spirit and in truth, and that we would make decisions and judgments and discernments that bring glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We come to this time now in the service where we celebrate communion. And we're going to sing the doxology here in just a few moments. And as we sing the doxology, the words in that are, are so appropriate because it, it, it directs our attention to the one who makes our vision clear. It directs our attention to the one who understands what our life is all about. And it directs our attention to the one we desperately need as we seek to see clearly. And so... We'll, uh, we'll sing that song now. passing out these elements and encourage you to reflect on what's going on in your life as we consider what Christ has done for us. that Christ was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, broken for you. Now keep in mind, the apostles up to this point had participated in numerous Passovers with Jesus Christ before. They had participated in, with them, and they, had, they understood the routine of it all, but Jesus changed things up that night when he said, this is my body. 
So as we take and eat this bread, which symbolizes his body, it's, 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 it's significant in that he's the one who gave his body to be sacrificed so that we could have life. He said, this, this is my body broken for you. Every time you get together, remember me. So we take, we eat, and we remember. And after they ate the bread, he then took the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for, for you for the forgiveness of sins. And so this, again, we're reminded that he said, this is my blood. This is my blood poured out. This represents that. And every time you drink this, you remember me. You remember the sacrifice that I made. The writer of Hebrews says this, that that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. Well, Jesus Christ's blood was shed. And because of that, we have forgiveness. And so we take, we drink, we remember. Adam talked earlier about, uh, during the offering, he talked about a benevolent offering that we take. And we do that at the first Sunday of every month. And so if you'd like to contribute to that, we invite you to do that because there are people in need. And that's where this fund goes to. It goes directly to those individuals who have perhaps lost a job or they're going through some, some crises that were unforeseen. And so we invite you to contribute generously to that and uh, as we seek to make a difference in this world through helping others uh, as they go through this time. All right, and so now we're going to sing one more song, correct? There we go. So I invite you to sing, and as I say it every week, let it loose, enjoy, and let's sing with great vigor and passion this great song. Praise to 
so we encourage you to proclaim that name, that name that is above every name, that name that represents Christ that can come in and remove those specks, remove those planks. And if you need to talk to somebody, please don't be afraid to reach out to us, whether it be with a phone call, an email, a text, whatever. We'd be more than happy to do that, uh, to help you in your understanding of who Christ is and what he does in a person's life. He's amazing. He is phenomenal, and he knows how to do what needs to be done in your life and my life as well. We encourage you to reach out to others with a text, a phone call. Let them know that you're thinking of them and praying for them, and uh, let us know how we can help you. God bless you. Have a great day. I miss you a ton. Enjoy it. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.